Hi everybody, so my name is Bruno Buzzi and I'm very happy to chair this session. So I try to share my screen to give you uh, an overview. Uh, it's here. So I hope you see the session five. So we will have uh, four presentations. Each presentation will uh, last uh, uh, 15 minutes, followed with uh, a five-minute session of uh, question, and you can use the uh, chat gadget or the Q&A gadget to ask your question, and I will uh, uh, read it to the presenter. So four presentations. The first one will be about uh, the collapse game by uh, Ingo Althofer. The second one will be about QBF encodings for positional games by Jaco van de Poel. The third one, the mathematical game by Marc Pierre. And the fourth one, Slicering Art by Cameron Braun. So uh, without uh, further waiting, I give the floor to Ingo. Ingo, it's your turn. Thank you, Bruno. Let me see if I can load my slides. Yes, it works. It's fine. Yes. Uh, the talk will have some historical remarks in the beginning and then some technical remarks yes, on Collard's game, Collard's problem, and so on. Wait. How can I switch? To, yes, Lothar Kollatz was a German mathematician born in 1910. He got a PhD in young years in Berlin in mathematics in 35. And in 37, he was an assistant in Karlsruhe. And he invented something very special, but only for his private fun. You will see that later. And then the war started, and Collatz became a leading scientist in the development of the V2 ballistics. So V2, the German rocket against London and Antwerpen. Then after the war in 1950, there was the first International Congress of Mathematics at Harvard. And after Harvard, several people started to spread an interesting open problem, Ulam did, Hasse did, Kakutani, Coxeter, and others. And this interesting problem had been proposed by Collatz. It was this very special thing he had designed in 37. Let me show you a photo of Collatz in very young years, age 16 or so, and another photo, uh, yes, from the Darmstadt years where the V2 ballistics was developed. Now a photo of the participants of International Congress of Mathematics in Harvard. Very large crowd. You see in the upper photo, I have a blue frame on the left side. And that is larger below. And there you see a red frame. And in that red frame, a person marked with X and another one with Y. X is Alvin Walter, professor in Darmstadt and the manager of the V2 ballistics project. And the person with the Y, you see his face only half, only the eyes, is Lothar Kollatz. And Walter was always a seller. And he always thought, yes, we lost the war, but no problem. The Americans will like us because we know a lot for instance, about rockets. And he had the idea we should sell us as best as possible. And Collatz had just a different opinion. He was ashamed that he had been working for this rocket. And the best he hoped for, nobody will remember that I did something in that project. And he had no chance. Walter ordered him to join this International Congress in Harvard. And what did Collatz do? He told all people the same problem, namely 
what he had designed in 37. Uh, one of the reasons is he did not want to speak about rockets. And the second reason is his English was poor. And telling this problem was very simple English. So let me go to the problem. The 3N plus 1 problem. Construct a sequence of natural numbers in the following way. Start with an initial number. And in the round T, number NT has been computed already. And now for the next round, if this number NT is odd, the next number is 3 times NT plus 1. You see, nt is odd, so 3 times nt plus 1 is even. The other case, if nt is even, nt plus 1 is half of nt. To show you examples, 1, from where we go to 4, from 4 we have down to 2, from 2 back to 1, so we have a cycle, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2. Another example from 3, we go to 3 times 3 plus 1 is 10. We have to get 5. 3 times 5 plus 1 is 16. And then we have half, half, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And the conjecture already stated by Collatz in his private diary in 37, each starting number should lead to one in finitely many rounds. I tell you a similar problem, 3n minus 1 problem. And the guys who designed that, Biele, Gospe, and Schröppel. Gospe is, has some fame because he was one of the few guys who initiated the hacker scene, in particular together with Greenblatt. And in 1972, they became interested by the Collatz problem and not only doing some computation there, they changed this. So now if the number is odd, you do not build 3 times n plus 1, but 3 times n minus 1. And if the number is even, you have, again, examples. 1 goes to 2, back to 1, so you have a cycle. 5 goes to 14, half is 7, go to 20. 10, 5, so you have a cycle with 5. And there exists a third cycle, 17 to 50 to 25, da, 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 da. And at the end, to 34 and 17 again. And the conjecture by Biele, Gospe, and Schröppel was each starting number leads either to 1 or to 5 or to 17 in finitely many rounds. And 3n plus 1, 3n minus 1 became very popular problems now because uh, Martin Garda, Gardner showed them in his column in the Scientific American. Recently, we designed a game based on these two puzzles, the 3n plus minus 1 game. Two players moving in turn, and the move starts at some odd number n, larger one. The player to move either goes to 3n plus 1 or to 3n minus 1. So she has only two choices, 3n plus 1 or 3n minus 1. Then the result is repeated, divide by 2 by 2 by 2 until an odd number is reached, and the other player is to move. The game ends when the new number is 1. Otherwise, yes, the other player. Examples, when you start at 3, you can win directly because you take 3 times 3 minus 1 is 8, going down 4, 2, 1, winner. If you start at 5, you go to 3 times 5 plus 1 is 16, and then 8, 4, 2, 1, again a winner. Starting at 7 is not so nice. You have two choices. From 7 to 20, 10, 
five and the opponent is to move, he will win. When you go from seven to 22 instead, halving to 11, then the opponent may go to 32 and then 16, eight, da, 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 one. So seven is a loss in two moves or in two rounds if the opponent plays perfectly. The question for which starting values of n and optimal play by both players, will there be a winner? The point is the state space has infinite size because there are infinitely many natural numbers. And for instance, always making the choice that there is one division by two, you climb up the ladder to infinity. But the conjecture is for optimal play, each starting n will lead to one in finitely many steps. And for our computations, we looked at a variant. The game is a draw if some value n above 150 millions is reached. So in this variant turned out backward analysis that all starting values between one and one million give win or loss. And interestingly, the proportion of lost positions is rather high, namely only 53% are wins and 47% are losses. On this slide, you see two statistics. One is which move length to win or loss is how often. And on the right side, you see which is the smallest number where, say, move length 40, 41 or so is reached. So you see in the set from 1 and 1 million, at most 100 moves are played. Yes, and it's, you have this logarithmic scale almost linear in that. More technical results on this game in the paper. Now I switch from the game to the old three M plus one problem. And what is simple to observe in the three M plus one problem in average, each three M plus one step is followed by two halving steps. It is at least one halving step, but it may be two or three or four. And so in average, there are two halving steps. Having this in mind, a large number n in average becomes about n times three quarters, so smaller. So when you start at a large number in the average, over many, many steps, you will go, go down, 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 reaching the region of one. And we have constructed variants of the problem where three quarter is substituted by a larger factor but still below one. Look at the three n plus one, five n plus one setting. This game, in this game, each round has two steps. First, the odd n is brought to three n plus one, then a repeated halving, resulting in some m, then m to five n plus one and repeated halving. And now you see three times five is 15 lower than 16. And computations by Thomas Siprot showed for small n, it always converges to small numbers. And but for 95 already in between, you have almost three trillions before you finally come up. And with 128 bit arithmetics, we had a Problem for 363 overflow. Similar is the game 515 n plus 1, n plus 1, another two round games. And here for 1787, we go up to 42 trillion. Three round, around a uh, story round with three steps 3n three plus 1. 3n plus 1, 7n plus 1, in between halving, halving, halving again, we get very, very large values 
And for four round game, three, five, 17, one. So three and plus one, five and plus one, 17, and even larger. You see in this last case, the product three times five times 17 times one is smaller than 256, but just by one only. I wanted to show something about the stochastic variant where we jump about that. Instead, I tell you what prices I offer. The first one is 500 euro, proof or disprove for the 3n plus minus 1 game that all starting values lead to 1, an optimal play by both players. And another prize for the original problem, prove or disprove the original collapse conjecture, 1,000 euro. Prices offered only for solutions submitted until December. 37, so 100 years from the invention, and there's a website telling the details. Some references. First, Martin Gardner really made this problem very popular in 72 by his Scientific American article. Richard Guy had in 2004 more details. Jeff Lagari has a full book. And Gardner learned about the problem from a book by Stanley Ogilvy. And Ogilvy was the book also led to the results by the three hackers in early 72. Terence Starr had the best theoretical partial results. Yes, and from my results, I took Wolfgang Wurst's random walks on infinite graphs for the theoretical background. Thanks. Thank you, Ingo. Uh, are there any questions? I look in the in the chat. I cannot see any question, and uh, not in the Q and A. And so, feel free to ask question in those two gadgets. Uh, and waiting for question from the audience. I have a I have a question. So, I feel that your idea of uh, transforming the 3n plus 1 problem into a two-player game is uh, very interesting. And it's a general question how your results about the two-player game can uh, be used into the original problem. Um, my, my hope is in some way that the game may have a simpler proof that all starting values will lead to 1. And maybe if once a proof of that is there, people may get ideas for a proof of the original problem. Mm. And maybe even someone cannot solve either this or that, but can set up a cross relation. If one for one problem the answer is, then for the other it is similar. Okay, I see. And I, I have a naive question. Um, in the in the original problem, are there uh, generalization uh, different from uh, 3n plus or minus 1? Uh, are there uh, other value different from 3 or, or 1? Yes, there are generalizations. The simple ones say not 3n plus 1, 3n minus 1. Instead, 3n plus 1, 3n plus 3 or 3n plus 3, 3n plus 5, or we even looked at uh, the variant where the moves are either 3n plus 1 or n plus 1. That is simpler, okay. and for that we have a proof that the game will end in finitely many steps with a win by one player. But of course, more interesting are the games where the answer is not so easy. Uh, you may have other moves say 5n plus 1 or 5n minus 1. But yes. in that case, it's almost sure to expect that the game will not terminate. Okay. But the proof is still an open problem. OK, I see. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I see something uh, uh, in the chat, uh, so I read it. Solving the game would be harder than the original puzzle. If we don't give choice of moves for the second play, then it is the original problem. So it's uh, 
it's a remark. Yes, okay. Uh, um, is it the, 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 this remark is interesting in the sense one player may have the choice and the other may not have the choice. And I think for that, there are good chances to prove that the player who has the choice will have a win. Mm. I see. So I have a, another question in the Q&A. Is there some interesting relationship between the two end game table bases, references that were on the references slide with the Collats game? Uh, I gave those two references only to show what our technical background for our analysis was. Ströhlein was the first with this table base approach in 1970, and then Thompson made it more general in 85, and Michael Hartisch did the computations following their footsteps. And the last question in the Q&A, Dimitri Ruzin, why is a three plus minus one game important? So a general question. Is there something that can be gained through solving this game? I think the game is not important. It just, it began to be fun for me. And then I found two other guys who were willing to help me with the program. I'm not a programmer. And what I hope is maybe the game is simpler to solve than the original collapse problem. And that from the proof of the game, we may gain insight in proofs for the original problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, the audience, for your question. And thank you, uh, Ingo, for your talk and your answers. So now let's move to the second presentation. Uh, so it's, I give the floor to Jaco van de Poel about uh, implicit uh, QBF. Thank Jaco. you. Thank you. Uh, you should be able to hear me now, right? Yes, you can start. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, so uh, this, this is uh, about uh, using QBF, quantified Boolean formulas for solving games. It's work with uh, Evan Sashaik, who was also in the audience. He, he was my PhD student, but he will start as a postdoc at a quantum uh, computing uh, company on the other side of the street here. And it's also work with uh, Valentin and with Abdallah. And Abdallah is known in your community. I think he presented also in the same conference uh, a while ago. He's from Australia and we are from Denmark and, and Germany. So um, I, I have too much material. So I decided to start with a short version of the lecture. That's a takeaway message. And then I will uh, see where, where we get. So the takeaway message that, is that we provide new techniques to encode a game in uh, QBF. Of course, QBF is already a sort of game. But for instance, uh, in the paper, we, we restrict to um, positional make a breaker games. And we have a translation of those games in QBF, which is more concise than uh, previous encodings. And our main motivation is to solve games in a, in, in a kind of independent way with an, uh, a general solver, not, not with a specific tool for per game, but with, with a general solver, like a SAT solver or QBF solver or, or planning tool, that kind of thing. Actually, I was at the physics department today for, and I got a tour through their quantum lab. And there um, they pointed to me that uh, actually the HEX game is originally from Aarhus University because it was Jens, Jens Lindhardt that apparently worked on this game and, and Pete Hein is very known for it, but Pete Hein published it, but they have been working together a, a lot uh, about this game. So may, so now it's kind of full circle. I'm presenting this again from Aarhus University. And then of course, also John Nash worked a lot on this game and proved uh, many interesting facts about the hex game. But um, yeah, our technique is more general. It's uh, for instance, generalized tic-tac-toe is also a positional game. So in our uh, QBF encoding, we, we call it implicit, but because what we do is we do not copy formulas for every position of the board and for every time step, but we kind of share uh, those formulas uh, by, by working in a more symbolic manner. And that, that's why the, the, the encodings are much smaller. And so we treat board positions uniformly, but also the winning conditions. Ex, ex, uh, uh, um, hex is won by making a path from uh, two borders, like this white path here. Uh, but there are many paths. So if you if you want to list all the possible winning conditions, it's it's a huge set. So so that also has to be treated uh, symbolically. So that's the contribution of our paper. And then later in a, in a follow up paper, actually we um, let me try to get rid of this window here. 
In a follow-up paper, we extend this also to non-positional games. So we also have QBF encodings, very concise of a break, a breakthrough, uh, connect for domineering, etc. I can hopefully say something at the end of the talk. Then, um, okay, so, so the paper uh, provides actually uh, eight uh, translations. We, we have some variations in uh, uh, representing the board of the game. It could be explicit, that's the traditional method. Lifted, as I uh, explained before, in a symbolic way, but it could also be completely stakeless. And then the winning conditions, well, you can list all the minimal paths that will be terrible in hex. You can uh, do it neighbor-based, and there's also a, a way to look at the transversal game, which seems to be easier in our case. So this gives a couple of uh, possibilities, and the paper has details about uh, these uh, translations. Um, okay, so I, I was running uh, ahead of myself, but let's let's just continue. These these are the uh, nine encodings or eight encodings that we gave. Actually, this one could also be generated, I guess, but we have not reported on this uh, translation. Good. So what are the results? Well, if you take just a normal 90 by 19 hex board, and if you try to um, uh, generate a, a QBF encoding in it with a traditional methods, you, you would not succeed um, because you would have to list all the, the winning paths, and that, that's just too many. But, but with our encoders, this can be done. So we can have an encoding uh, with explicit boards in just 25K, which is not that large. And uh, using these symbolic methods, even in 5K, so the hex 90 by 90 board, um, we can win it in 45 moves, and that, that formula can be expressed in a QBF formula of just 5,000 characters. And that, that's not a lot. And if it was, it was a set problem, then it was very easy to solve. I mean, set, set solvers typically can solve problems with this size. But now, unfortunately, this is a QBF thing, and it's much harder to solve this. But now, at least we can express these uh, formulas in, in QBF. So just solving this QBF formula will solve hex can be won in 360 moves. Well, you don't. You probably don't need 360 moves, right? So maybe you need 45 or 91. So why? And and here we do it for arbitrary positional games. So if you have, if you want to win the game in D steps, so D is the game depth, and you have a board of n positions, and then you have some winning set that you have to list. Um, so that could be large or not. Then our encodings. So here are six encodings. Uh, need this many variables and um, this many clauses. So this gives the size for arbitrary positional games. And if you analyze this a bit, then yeah, why why can't we generate this for uh, listing all winning conditions? Well, the, all winning conditions is the only encoding here that needs the winning set as an explicit size. So so if the size is too large, you cannot generate it. So that's clear. Why why is lifted the best here? Well, because the lifted one is the only one where the number of variables is logarithmic in the number of positions of the board, right? So if you have 100 uh, uh, positions on the board, you only need log 100 uh, variables to encode it. So, so that's the, the, the logarithmic thing here. That's why th these are so small. Now, unfortunately, this has a cost. The cost is that the alternations in this QBF formula are higher, and, and, and the solver are sensitive to the alternations. So there's a price to pay. And then we were very happy to find this SN encoding, the stateless encoding. This also is log n. You see that here? It's also log n. But unfortunately, there is a d square uh, penalty here. And you see it here. If you increase the depth, then here we have a 2 megabyte uh, formula in Sn. And it's really suffering from this uh, depth. This d square is uh, hurting. So, so um, that's, uh, that's where the stateless encoding suffers. So, so the LT and the LN encodings are really the most concise encodings, which doesn't mean that you can solve the game as fast Actually, we found that with ET, you can solve the game faster, but that will be at the end of the talk. Good. I think this was the quick uh, run through. So there was already some, uh, some message here. So now I would like to make a short detour through planning and how we got to QBF. Actually, we started in planning, not in games. So uh, planning, well, it's, you, you know this, right? You, you have some worlds, you have some actions, and you want to find uh, the shortest plan to uh, to reach a certain goal from a certain initial state. That's just classical planning. And, and people have been using SAT solving uh, to solve that. It's well known. Then you get this kind of formula. So uh, we have here three states. So we want to have a plan of three steps. Initially, um, uh, we are in S0. Then we have two steps or two actions. And now here we are in the goal state. And this is just a SAT formula. You can give it to SAT solver, and it will uh, give you the plan. But there is some duplication here. We duplicate this formula A, which could be a large formula. And if you do these games, then within an A, there's also a lot of duplication. 
because the A talks about all the board positions. And maybe we, we, we don't want to generate such huge formulas and we want to share these copies of A. And that's actually what leads us to, uh, to look in a, a QBF because that's much more concise. Okay, so, so here's a, actually an, an, an uh, example from a quantum circuit optimization problem. We solved it with planning. We presented this just last November and we got the, a domain award in the planning conference for this quantum uh, uh, domain. So that's quite kind of nice. But there is some C not operator. I'm not going to explain that, but it has um, uh, seven or eight uh, arguments. And if you have to fill in all those arguments and you have to fill them in for such solving, you will get uh, an explosion of uh, possibilities. And, and th that's one of the things you don't want to have these explosions. So we need more symbolic uh, encodings. And um, yeah, this is the paper where we started doing this, uh, uh, avoid this grounding problem uh, using QBF. So, that was, so we started uh, really at this planning uh, conference. That's a bit about the background. So in this case, if you have here uh, four objects, L objects and, and five P objects and 10 G objects, then this would already give rise to 400,000 possible, possible uh, actions that you can take. And, and, and we have also worked on um, organic synthesis problems. And there are uh, like, like 25 or so uh, arguments here. And every argument has maybe uh, 20 objects and it's astronomic. In this case, you cannot even generate the SOT instance. And we could solve such problems still with QBF. So that, that was the, the starting point for us. So, so what's the secret here? Well, in QBF, you, you do not only have propositional logic, but you can also use these quantifiers. And now you have to be careful. The order of the quantifiers matters. And in this case, you saw it already. Maybe only the third formula here is, uh, is true. But let's just think a bit. How, how can you use that to compress a formula? So assume you have a large formula phi. And you want to say that phi of A is true. And phi of b is true. Now you have two copies of this huge formula phi, not exactly the same copies, but two variations of phi. But actually, we can use quantifiers to make this shorter. So what could you do? You could say for all x, if x is this a or x is this b, then phi of x should hold. Now this only has one copy of phi. So we have kind of halved the size of this formula by just introducing one, uh, one quantifier. So that, that's the principle why QBF formulas can be more concise than just a soft formula. Good. Um, now, uh, so we get now QBF uh, encodings and we can use existing uh, QBF solvers like Cake. So we did not build our own QBF solver, we just use solvers that are there. But they are, uh, yeah. And, and, and here is a part of the secret in the planning problem. So in the planning problem, we, we, we will say, well, there exists a plan of actions. And now we say for all uh, possible object combinations, so this is now symbolic. So instead of giving all the instances, we have now variables that say for all possible instances, uh, the formula should hold. And now there's only one copy of this T. It, it's not grounded for, for, for all the predicates, there's only one copy of this T. And I, I cannot explain such formulas in detail in this, this short time, I think. But, but the secret is really in this uh, one for all that uh, makes this formula a lot shorter. And the prices that we have now exist for all exists, which makes solving a bit harder. Okay, I think I should skip uh, a few of the steps here, uh, back to hex. So after doing this planning, we thought, okay, we are now in QBF, why not do two player games? Because now we just say, well, there exists a move by player one, for all moves by player two, there exists a move by player three, etc. And then, um, well, we have just a game player, right? Uh, and then here we say, well, there exist states, and now the state should be connected by moves. And in the last uh, state, S5 should, should have one. And then we use the compression techniques on top of this. So that was the, our motivation to, to start this. And now, well, if you, if you start encoding uh, QBF formulas in the explicit state, you, you can do this in, in kind of uh, literally, but saying there exist all these moves. And then because it's hex, you, you want to say that you have one, so you want to say there exists this winning um, condition. So that this is just, there exists a path on the board. And again, I will guide you quickly through all the formulas. These formulas say that uh, the board is updated for all the moves. So you propagate the white and the black positions. And this part says, actually, you have a winning path. So this says, if, if number i on this path is uh, true, then the next one should be a neighbor. So it should really be a path of neighbors on the board. And now everything is symbolic, and this is a small, relatively small formula in expressing hex. And, and this is um, uh, what we call the symbolic, uh, using the symbolic neighbor relation 
to enumerate all parts. And if you want to go one step further, and if you want to also be symbolic in the board positions, then you get this kind of uh, encoding. Now, now we use a circuit format. And uh, this encoding again says, that, well, there are these moves, player one move, player two move, etc. And there is this witness path. Now you have to check that everything is correct for all the board positions. Now we use one extra quantifier here for all symbolic board positions. Well, we have a winning condition and, and the black and the white moves work, but there's no, not much copying going on in this part. So this is even smaller than the previous one. Well, let me uh, go to the uh, experiments. We experimented with Heinz benchmarks. So three by three, five by five from previous papers, we could now also solve seven by seven. And we also wanted to try 90 by 19 boards. So we cannot solve it, of course, but at least we could generate these formulas as I showed at the beginning. And then we looked at some uh, human played games from the HEX championships. And we, we just took the best players on 90 by 19 boards. And these games are given up very early. And as a, as a well, I'm, I'm not a HEX player. So I, I have no idea why somebody would have won or not. And also our solver doesn't know. And even the best solver, Wolf, does not always is not always able to solve a game that is already given up by a champion uh, X player. So that was quite interesting for us. But what we did is we, we took those games that were given up, and then for depth 11 to 17, this gave us false instances because it would need maybe 15 moves to win the game. And then we solved them with Wolf. If they could be solved, we rolled them back a couple of steps. And this gave us some true instances for limited depth. And, and we could solve those things with uh, QBS solvers. And then um, let me, uh, well, we, we tried many QBS solvers and many preprocessors. And I can talk about this offline if you are interested. And, and we got these kind of results. So previous, we have the gray dots. Now with the new encodings, we get a bit further. We can do the large uh, games. The explicit boards are still faster than the lifted boards, but the lifted boards can generate larger games, but not solve them. But the fastest one is here going to the traversal game, actually. This could solve all the high uh, instances. And these are the championships uh, instances. Again, you, you cannot do this even for the old uh, encoding, which lists all the paths. So here we can only do the symbolic encodings. The explicit boards are, again, the fastest, and the symbolic ones uh, lag a little behind, but are still feasible on this. So let me um, uh, stop here and, and, and give you the chance to ask some questions. So thank you, uh, Jaco. Um, thank you for, for your very clear uh, presentation. Uh, I could catch uh, many things uh, and uh, I have the takeaway message. And uh, thank you for this and all your clear explanation how to uh, start with planning and then to go to two-player uh, QBF. So it was very interesting. Uh, in the paper, you mentioned a competition uh, of last year. Uh, what are the results? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, we still have to analyze the results, but we we have submitted these uh, these games to the QBF evaluation uh, competition. So there it has run on several tools, and this gives tons of data. Um, I, I don't, so 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 one one way could be just to use uh, the best winner from now on in these type of games. But actually, what we would like is to learn why certain QBF solvers solve these problems, and we think. These problems have a different shape than the community has looked at before. And uh, we noticed that, um, uh, for instance, if we use the CNF format, then there are strong QBF solvers. But in CNF, a lot of structure is lost. And if we use circuit structure, then um, then, then the preprocessors are suboptimal. So I think the community could really um, uh, work on these games. So currently, uh, you can just uh, look at the data of the current solvers. But I would expect, because this is now part of the QBF for eval benchmarks, I would expect that future solvers can uh, will, will be better on exactly this type of encodings. It's very encoding sensitive, of course, also how the solvers uh, expect. But we have been doing the same with the quantum circuits. We submitted them to the planning conference. And 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 yeah, so um, just to get that community, uh, we are not building solvers ourselves, but we want that that community works on this type of problems. Yeah. OK, thank you. And have you tried uh, to encode uh, Go positions? Uh, no, we have not done it. I think Go would be a bit difficult because in Go, uh, you 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 have to find these uh, islands that are closed, and that's a little bit hard to encode in pure SAT or uh, um, um, 
QBF. So I think you could do it maybe by by taking some other bounds, say we, we only deal with islands of a certain fixed size. But I think okay. the goal rules, yeah, when, when you can capture a large area, then the, capturing this is one move where a lot of things happen. And that, that's relatively difficult in um, in in in, in SAT and QBF encodings. But but actually we went we went beyond uh, a positional games like breakthrough, domineering, etc. And we I have some, some yes. domain specific language there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I see that there are questions in the in the chat. So Jan to everyone, giving up quickly is typical for connection games. It often becomes very clear very soon to an expert that one side is hopelessly lost. Explaining why to a non-expert is not always easy. So it's a remark. Maybe you can react. Yeah, I know I know, I know for heck because Abdullah was on our team and Abdullah is actually a strong hex player. So Abdullah showed me there are all these patterns like if you if you can form a ladder, then then you have one. And I, I think we could we could make use of that in our encoding, but our purpose is to make a general game solver and, and not yes. be too specific and build in all kinds of hex patterns. But it's exactly th those type of patterns. Uh, there's not only letters, there are several patterns. And if you see them, then, then you know ah, this is going to be lost. But the play would still be 15 or, or 20 moves ahead, and that's beyond the horizon of the of, of just the solver. Yeah. Uh, so I, I fully agree with the remark. Yeah. A question from Frank Lance. When you translate a problem like the planning problem into a two-player game, is there any opportunity to apply the self-play techniques that have been so successful for training models to play traditional games like chess and go to these more theoretical games? Uh, yeah, that, that's that's really an interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer. Of course, we, we, we there's my planning problem. It was a little back. Uh, am I still sharing? Yes. Um, so so here's our planning problem. So it says there exists a plan, and now we say, well, for all um, for all positions in the board, the plan was correct. So the second player comes very late here. The first player has to give the complete plan, and now the second player has to check that the plan is valid. And and the, the only purpose here is is to make the formula short and to to, to uh, in, in checking not copy. This formula several times, but I don't think this will help in in, in two players finding the plan uh, together because the first player has to come up with the full plan here. So it's an intriguing thought, but I, I don't think our work leads to uh, to such an advancement. But yeah, we can think about it. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, there are many other questions. I cannot read it all, and we have to stop. So we move, uh, we thank you for your presentation, uh, Jaco, and we move to Marc Pierre for the third presentation about uh, mathematical game. Thank you. I will try to answer in the chat. And maybe Ifrance can also answer in the chat. Thank you. Marc, is this, uh, you have okay. the floor. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Marc Pierre, and I'm here to present you the paper, The Mathematical Game written by Quentin Cohen-Solal, Tristan Casnave, and me. The main topic of this paper is tree search in a context of mathematical uh, theorem proving. So tree search, especially Monte Carlo tree search, has been successfully applied in many games and problems. For example, AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and Katago achieve superhuman performance. So our goal was to use this type of tree uh, exploration in a program which builds a math a mathematics proof like an NR tree game. This work has already been no done, notably by uh, Olofras and Metagen. However, this research focuses mainly on the neural network, their training and their architecture, but not on their uses and possible tree exploration. This is why we have chosen to try different tree, uh, tree search algorithms and propose a new one in the context of holophrasm without changing the neural network provided and their training. So I will start by briefly explaining how uh, a mathematics proof translates to an or tree game and all the networks provided by holophrasm. Then I will present all the tree search algorithms we tried to improve the performance of holophrasm and their results. 
Finally, I will conclude with a comparison between algorithm and how to improve this work. If you have any question or issue, feel free to ask at the end of my presentation. So no, now we will see uh, how Holofrasm translates a mathematical proof into an end or tree and how these three are built during the research. First, we need the mathematical language to process math, and uh, in this context, metamath is used. In metamath, a mathematical theorem is a set of hypotheses which contain variable, the conclusion of the theorem, and a proof. The main feature of metamath is substitution of variable, and uh, I will explain that uh, now. So imagine uh, you want to prove uh, the statement, if A is true, not not A is true. For that, we put the conclusion of our theorem, not not A is true, as a root in the tree. So this is the final st statement we want to prove. Then we seek for a proposition, a metamath proposition that fit this conclusion. So for example, in this case, uh, proposition one said, uh, if an uh, assertion is false, then not assertion is true. So now we use the, the metamath substitution where we substitute in proposition one the variable assertion with not A. So it remains to prove the, the initial hypothesis of proposition one, which is if not A is false. And as before, we use another proposition, another uh, substitution of variable, and it remains to prove if A is true, but A is true is the initial hypothesis of uh, our statement. So now we have seen how we build a mathematical proof. We will uh, we now see how Holofrasm build and search for a, a mathematical proof. So for that, it uses two types of node, or node and n node. So or node are the statement node, the mathematical statement node. They are called or node because we consider we consider or node proven if at least one of its ch children is proven or when it is one of the initial hypotheses, or not that are provided uh, with a uh, value given by the payoff network of Holofrasm, this value represents the solvability of the node. For n node, n node represents a proposition combined with a substitution, with a metamath substitution. They are called n node because a proposition is true if all of its children are proven and, this, and the children of an n node are the initial hypothesis of the proposition. N nodes are provided with a, a politics given by the relevance network of Holofrasm, and substitution are found with the generative network of Holofrasm. So now we have, I've, uh, I've explained what are the two types of nodes, how Holofrasm combines them to build the proof. So as before, we put the final statement of, our, of the theorem we want to prove in the root, in the or node, which is the root of our tree, and we will visit this root until it is considered proven, or we reach a time limit or a maximum number of visits. When we are in the or node, we have uh, three different cases. The first case, the or node doesn't have children that is not proven, so we use the generative network and the relevance network to find a end node, then we return to the root of the tree. The second case is when uh, we have you have multiple choice of n node, and for that we use our tree search algorithm to find the best to visit. And the last case is when you have enough visited a node but is not proven, so you add you add another n node. Why we do that? Why we implement a progressive widening? Because in math you have an infinite possibilities of tactics. At the end of each visit of the node, you recursively uh, upgrade uh, the value and if uh, and the state of the node if it is considered proven or not. So now I will uh, detail all the three search algorithm uh, we tried. So first, I, ju I just want to clarify that the interest of this three search algorithm are to answer the question which end node to choose where we are visiting an or node. So the first one, the first uh, algorithm is the one provided by Holofrasm. So Holofrasm uses this formula when you are in an or node, 
you compute you compute this value for all and uh, children and you visit the maximizer this is heavily inspired by the bandit algorithm ucv and when you are in a n node you visit the least promising or node so i will explain that later so how these terms are initialized and, and updated as i said before the end probability is given by the relevance network of all of us, and the end value is initialized with the worst, the worst children value. This is update. Uh, this is update uh, as the same, uh, with the same principle. So you you use the worst or nudge value uh, for uh, or not value. You use as I said before. You initialize it with. Uh, the payout network, which uh, is the solvability of the node, and uh, you update it by making the sum of all these children. So why in a N node you visit the least promising or node? It's because it improves directly the value of the N node. And if the N node needs to be proven, you need to visit all of his children. So here you have the results of the algorithm on the first 200 theorems of Holofrasm test set, and with a parameter of 10 for the beam search used in the generative network. So on the x-axis, you have uh, the settings. So the, on the left, the max passes, so the number uh, of uh, visits you allowed, and uh, on the right, the time in minutes. And on the y-axis, you have the number of theorems proved over uh, 200. So the first change we we want to try is changing the, the formula of the exploration without changing the value. So for that, we tried PUCT, with, uh, but without changing the value. And uh, when we are looking at the result, we see that Holofrasm performed better on the first setting, but not on the last. So as I said before, when we are uh, seeking uh, for the value of Holofrasm, in a or node, you compute, you update it by making the sum of all n nodes. So when you are doing that, you are losing the, the interpretation of this value, which is the, the value is the solvability of the node. So for that, we tried another algorithm, which is product propagation. So the idea is to change the visit and the values attributed to the node during the search. So we keep the probability interpretation, the value is seen as a probability and the children are assumed to be independent. Thus, the value of an N node is the product of the value of its children and the value of an R node is, calculating, is calculated using the same principle, but with the additional probability. In an R node, we explore the best value child and in an N node, the worst. The value of a leaf can be initialized with, with one or by the payoff network given by all of us. But in our case, we use the payout network for better results. So pro project propagation performs better than Holofrasm and seems, uh, seems more efficient because as we can see, if in the settings of 500 uh, visits and one minute, we reach 138 propositions. So with the same spirit as, uh, as product propagation, we tried proof number, search, proof number search. So the idea is to count the number of leaves left to explore, either to prove the node or to disprove it. During, so during the node initialization, an unproven node is initialized with a proof number and, uh, with, and a disproof number. So I, will, I won't go into uh, the details, but uh, proof number search uh, performs quite better uh, than all of France, but not better than, than product propagation. So now we tried another algorithm uh, which uh, which uh, have been presented uh, in a paper called uh, Hyper Tree Proof Search for Neural Theorem Proving. So uh, we tried it to compare the results of different approach, approach, but in this context. However, an adaptation is necessary because the, the interface used are different. So the idea is to select a subtree of, of the proof tree expand the leaves, then update only the value of the end node of this subtree using product propagation. So transpose to our interface. This is like using PUCT to select end node, but, but once in the end node, expand all its or children. 
in this context, it takes too much time to expand all the OR node because our relevant network is not efficient enough. So we can see that the hypertrive proof search is not performing well, but it's scaling well with time. So now I will present the new algorithm we tried. This is not the, the, for that, the idea is just to combine the product propagation value with the PUCT exploration. Why? Because with this approach, we keep the aspect of, prob of, uh, the, of uh, probability, but having a bounded exploration. So we obtain the advantage of these two algorithms, and uh, this algorithm is the one uh, is the most performing one, except uh, in the last setting, because we tried another algorithm which is the same idea as before. So product propagation for the value, but the modified bandit, which is a combination uh, combination of the holofrasme bandit and PUCT. And this this algorithm is uh, the best is uh, the best performing one in the settings of four uh, thousand visit and four minute uh, exploration. So you have here a, fin a final comparison. So as we can see, in general, the best algorithm in this context in the, is uh, in this context of four thousand and four minute is our modified PUCT combined with the product propagation value. And in other settings, this is uh, the only the, com the combination of uh, the PUCT and product propagation. So, in conclusion, we studied different algorithms applied to theorem proving in Metamat. Algorithms such as PUCT, proof number search, or product propagation obtain better results than the search used by Holofrasm. Finally, we propose a new algorithm by combining the idea of PUCT and product propagation value and obtain better results. Our initial goal was to improve the search used by the Holofrasm interface. The different algorithm we proposed, always as, as well as the different solution we provided, enable this improve, improvement. Alfu, the improvement is slight, and we plan to test this algorithm in other contexts. So thank you, thank you for your listening. If you have a question, or feel free to ask. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation. So I, for the moment, I don't see any question in the Q&A and in the, in the chat. So I have uh, one quick question. Uh, looking at the curves of your results, uh, it seems that there are about, uh, I would say, 15 uh, crucial problems. I mean, by crucial, uh, a problem uh, which can uh, swap from uh, if you change the game tree tool, uh, a crucial problem can be solved or not solved according of the game tree tool. So have you, have you look in details in the, in the internal of the uh, of the solving, what happens for those uh, crucial problems? Um, what do you, sorry, I don't understand. What do you mean by crucial problems? Uh, because I see that all your curves, uh, all your tool uh, solve more or less uh, 120 yes. problem. I think they are, they can be called uh, easy. And yes. there are about 50 problems that are not solved by your approach, uh, given the time limits and the number of yes. passes. So I, I call them a hard problem. And okay. in between, you have, a, you have the crucial problem, which can be solved or not solved according to the, the, algorithm, the algorithm that you use. And my question is, uh, uh, did you look into the detail of the of the output of the algorithm to see what happens or not happen uh, in a, in a, in a way of uh, finding a solution. So um, in general, the principal constraint constraint was time. Uh, when we are see, when we are when we are looking of uh, theorem and uh, and we are we are looking for the number of paths. Uh, you have the the main problem is that the relevant the generative network you used for gener for generate n node 
are in some problem really, really slow. And uh, with a, in, 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 in the settings of 4,000 limit for visit and four minutes, some theorem have only been visited 100 times. So, yeah. so is, this is really, uh, and this is really dependent of the problem because in other settings, uh, we reach uh, really easily the 4,000 uh, limit, uh, the 4,000 visit than, than we set, but uh, in only one minute. So the, the, I, can, I can't answer generally for you uh, at your question. Okay, I see. Uh, so if you have, uh, I would say, uh, uh, 10,000 for the max passes and uh, 10 minutes for 10 and the time limit of 10, uh, do you think it would be interesting to run uh, the blue algorithm or the red one because they yes. are very promising? Yes. Uh, yes, because especially the red one because uh, it scales very well uh, on time because uh, the red one develop all or node at the same time, and he's, he's not uh, selecting the least promising one. Okay, I see. Thank you. I see that there are questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I must uh, select a question. Uh, Concerning your talk, uh, Jacob van der Poel, to everyone, question, you applied this to mathematical proof search. Can your method work for any and or tree? Uh, yeah, you can try. Uh, we didn't try in another context, so maybe uh, you can test for uh, to know uh, if, uh, if uh, the new algorithm we propose uh, uh, are performing well in any and or three, uh, but uh, the the main issue is that uh, this algorithm, uh, uh, this comparison, is heavily dependent of the context of all of, of metamat and holofrasm, and this is heavily dependent of the fact that we have uh, a progressive waning because you have an infinite possible uh, tactics to resolve uh, or not. Okay, so thank you very much. I think there is no other question uh, in the chat. So we stop here. We thank you for your presentation. And I... Q &A, sorry, there, there is one in the Q&A. Oh, yes. In the Q&A, uh, do you have some modeling simulation software for your methods like Olofrasm or Hypertree, PS, etc.? cetera? Uh, no. Uh, we, uh, we all of us is open source so if you want to try uh, you can implement our algorithm but we didn't have a modeling uh, a modeling tool uh, or software okay and uh, and other I just want to mention that other paper uh, that tackle the problem so hypertrick proof search or uh, or the, uh, so are, uh, are not uh, open source. So you have some open source uh, software if you want to try, but not all uh, are open. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark. So now I give the floor to the next presenter, Cameron Brown, about slicing art. Hello. Okay, uh, I'm Cameron from Maastricht University, and I'll be talking about Sliverlink art. So Sliverlink is a pure deduction puzzle. It's in the family of Jap Japanese logic puzzles such as Sudoku. Each Sliverlink challenge involves a rectangular grid of points in a square lattice and hints in some cells with uh, values 0, 1, 2, or 3. The aim is to draw a single closed path through the grid points that visits each hint cell on the specified number of sides. So each challenge should provide a single unique solution. And on the right, we have a typical challenge and its unique solution. Now the hint sets tend to be symmetrical in good handcrafted challenges, but the solution paths do not. And the solution paths tend to be arbitrary shapes. 
So I'm looking at two questions. The first is whether we can design swiveling challenges that produce artistic solution paths. And the second question is how can we automate this process? So the ultimate aim is to produce attractive swiveling challenges that yield attractive solution paths. Now there's been some work towards this. Some designers like to include Easter eggs in their um, designs. For instance, their initials will appear in the solution path or special symbols. And a few years ago, um, OP developed software for producing picture slither links where the user loads a pixel art image that describes the solution path shape and challenges are generated. But there are some issues with this approach. Uh, the process is not fully automated and the hint sets themselves tend to be a bit arbitrary. They're not symmetrical. And if you're familiar with Slitherlink, you will see where, where the solution path lies. And if you look at the um, resulting solution paths, they could also be a bit more artistic, like the foreground figure could be a bit clearer. More importantly, these puzzles are far too difficult for human players to enjoy. They're frustrating rather than interesting. One way we can measure the difficulty of a deduction puzzle is to use deductive search, which seeks to emulate the human solution process. So we model um, puzzles as CSP problems, and we perform deductions. Um, the two basic deductions are shaving, where for each given variable, we test its possible values and we eliminate contradictions. And the other one is agreement, where for each unresolved variable, we test all possible values and we resolve other variables that agree for all solutions. So this gives us some different levels of deduction that we can apply. So level zero is where we don't actually apply deductions, but trivial simplifications based on the rules. Level one deductions are where we apply the shaving and agreement deductions. Level two is where we have to apply deductions within deductions um, in order to progress in the solution. So this is very difficult for humans to do mentally. So we typically only want a few percent or fewer level two deductions. And level three deductions are where we have deductions nested within deductions, nested within deductions. And the human brain is just not made for that. So the results here show deductive search results for the Mario picture sliver link. And what we see is quite a few level one deductions. That's, that's good. That make, makes it a challenging, difficult puzzle. But we have a lot of level two deductions, including 48 level two agreements, which makes this a very, very hard puzzle and not enjoyable to solve. So uh, one thing we want to ensure is that the challenges generated by this process are deducible. So my approach is summarized here. It's quite simple. The user loads an image. The image is pixelated to the puzzle grid and the boundary is corrected. For each cell in the grid, we generate all hints, and then we remove superfluous hints to leave the final hint set. And so ideally, this final hint set should be deducible at level one. It should be symmetric, minimal, and evenly spread. Now, one way we can define the hint set is to manually um, describe the shape of the path in a text file using zeros and ones to indicate which cells are inside or outside the, the boundary. So this gives us precise control over the solution path and it avoids pixelation problems when we load an image. Uh, but this is pretty tedious and time consuming and we really want to automate this process from an image. So instead, um, we can load an image and pixelate it to the grid to give a single four connected set of cells within the grid. So we need this if the solution path is to be single, simple and closed, and so that it has an inside and outside according to the Jordan curve theorem. So the steps are we load an image, we pixelate it to the grid. Uh, on the bottom left, we have a typical uh, pixelated image. We need to fill the holes. So there are no holes in the shape. 
for any diagonal adjacencies, we need to add cells to make them orthogonal. And then we need to remove any noise. So any other connected sets get removed. And then we take the boundary of this shape and this is our solution path. So this process is very simple. So obtaining the solution path is easy, but obtaining a suitable hint set is quite difficult. So the ideal hint set will be symmetric, minimal. It'll cover the grid area quite evenly, and there'll also be an even spread of the hint values, and it won't visually reveal the solution path. So I implemented five strategies for achieving this, and I'll just go through those quickly. The first strategy for creating the final hint uh, set is to choose a predefined pattern from a library of um, the patterns shown. Then we just repeat that pattern across the grid and mask out the hints accordingly. So this gives nice symmetric results as shown at the bottom. So the results are symmetric. And as you can see, they give a pretty good coverage of the grid area. And they usually give deducible solutions. And this approach is very fast. This um, example shown is quite a large to the link, uh, but this was generated and tested in less than one second. However, there are some problems. You can see that uh, there's a lot of superfluous hints that are not necessary to the puzzle solution. And a lot of them are zeros, which tend to give away the, the puzzle shape, the solution shape a bit too easily. Uh, but these problems can be remedied a bit, depending on the image that you choose to load. The second style of hint patterns are concentric rings. So these give high symmetry, they look quite artistic, and they give a pretty minimal result and they hide the solution path. However, they rarely work um, to give a deducible result. And typically, I had to do an automated search over many grid sizes until I found a de deducible result. Spiral hint patterns are similar, where you start at the center and you have a continuous uh, trail of spiral hints spiraling outwards. These also give high symmetry. Now, these work for most cases, uh, but they're not minimal. There are, there are more hints there. And again, you can see a lot of zeros that tend to reveal what the final hint path will look like. They're a bit too regular. The fourth strategy I tried was called subtractive puzzle design. This is a form of retrograde analysis where we start with all possible hints, then we repeatedly remove symmetric subsets of hints while the result remains deducible at level one. So this always produces a deducible result. On the left is a typical output from this process for the shape on the right. But you'll notice that there's a lot of area uh, that's uh, just blank with no hints. So to give even coverage, it's useful to perform a third step, which is to restore some symmetric uh, subsets of hints to populate the empty areas. So the end result is what we get in the middle. Um, it's quite symmetric. It gives a quite even coverage. It hides the solution path. And it's reasonably minimal, except for the area fills, which tend to be zeros. It's always deducible. And this usually produces interesting and reasonably difficult challenges. One problem is that this is a much slower process. And the fifth approach I tried is using pictorial hint patterns. So what we do is we load a hint set from file. It, it could be an image or it could be an ASCII text file. And this produces picture to picture challenges where the hint set shows a picture and the solution path shows a picture. So this um, approach is very artistic. We have good control over the hint set and it allows these nice visual jokes. For example, here we have a Pac-Man hint set producing a space invader solution path or the dollar converting to euro. So there are some issues with this approach. Um, it's, it doesn't give minimal hint sets. You can see there's a lot of uh, fill there. A lot of these hints will be um, redundant. And it can 
take quite a while to design a good artistic headset that actually works with the um, solution path you want. And I'll just thank Nesta Romero, Mer, sorry, Nesta Romero Andres for suggesting the picture to picture challenges. So in conclusion, I'd say that yes, um, to both research questions, we can design sliveling challenges that produce artistic solution paths. And yes, the process can be automated. So the main, main outcomes um, I found from this work are that the repeated hint patterns give the fastest and most reliable results. The subtractive hint patterns give the best puzzles and the pictorial hint patterns give the most artistic results. So there are some caveats here. Uh, I didn't do any formal user testing as such, uh, just with friends and colleagues. And I can make no guarantees on how interesting or really difficult these challenges are. So this process doesn't yet compete with handcrafted designs by experts, but I think it's a, a step in the right direction. And if you want to test out the software that made these examples, it's freely available on my website. So thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Cameron, for your very clear presentation. First of all, I have a small question uh, to catch uh, what happened for in patterns, can you put the slide about uh, in patterns, for example, the repeated uh, in patterns? My uh, the the next one, please. With the dragon, yes, uh, I could not catch. Uh, what was it? You who decide to. To, to draw a dragon, or is it included implicitly in the repeated in patterns? Uh, so I specified the grid size, grid size I wanted, which is something mm -hmm. like 42 times 24. I load the dragon image. Okay. Then I choose the repeated hint pattern and choose one of the patterns from the library. Okay, and so I see. the image is loaded, all the hints are calculated, and then I just mask out according to this hint pattern repeated across the grid. Okay, thank you. And for the third one, the spiral hint pattern, you obtain a spiral. So is it uh, is it uh, a coincidence that uh, a spiral? Uh, yes, it is. It's, a, it's another visual joke. I was showing okay. that the square spiral, which is quite okay. um, quite high precision, can produce a round low precision spiral. Uh, the image could be anything. Okay, thank you. So there are uh, Q&A, so I read them. Jacques Van Rieswijk, there are also slice ring puzzles on different grids, such as hexagons. Can your method be extended to those? Uh, yes, we just have to pixelate the image to hexagons, but that's um, quite doable. I had planned to actually include that in this paper, but did not have time to do so. Okay, so I go on hexagons with... would be a better choice because mm -hmm. you can pixelate the hexagons with less error than than pixelating to a square grid. So the the final pictures would be would be better, I think. Okay, thank you. The next the next question in the slicer link: the uniqueness of the solution is often an important clue. In the deduction process, do you challenges guarantee that the solution is unique? Absolutely, yes. And uh, uniqueness should only be used in the solution process if there is the possibility of multiple solutions. Uh, but Nikolai, the company who published Liverlink, are uh, adamant that every puzzle should have a single unique solution. Uh, so ideally, uniqueness should not be used in the solution process either. Okay, thank you. Another question from Eza Koskinen. Does it seem possible to use these uh, algorithms to design puzzles that only have specific level of deductions? Uh, yes. I don't know if that's achievable uh, constructively, but using a generate and test approach, you can. Um, for example, some 
of the challenges I tried weren't deductible at level one. So I then increased to level two and found solutions. Uh, the level two deductions take a lot longer to calculate. So I kept my calculations at level one for this paper. Okay, thank you. A uh, question in the chat. Uh, slicer link puzzles for three colors instead of two? Um, I don't see how that would work. Uh, slither link puzzles rely on the inside outside of the boundary curve. So it is very much a, a binary puzzle. Uh, can you elaborate on how three colors would work? Uh, Whoever asked the question? Ingo Altofer. Uh, so uh, I think there are no uh, other questions so uh, maybe we can uh, stop here thank you very much uh, you. Cameron and uh, I think I can say that the session uh, terminates and I give back the floor to the hosts. Thank you, uh, everybody. Mm -hmm.